church, we're starting a new series today in the book of Galatians. So you can open your Bibles there if you'd like. We're going to be walking through the book of Galatians over the next many weeks. I don't know exactly how many weeks yet. Uh, It's going to be several. We're going to take our time. We're going to see what God has for us. But I want to begin with a question. How well would you say you know the gospel? We're starting this series entitled Only Jesus. By the way, I want to thank uh, Miss Sarah Fontenot for the design here. She did all these slides for us. Sarah did a great job. She's a great graphic designer. If you need graphic design work, find Miss Sarah Fontenot. She's awesome. All right? When it, when it comes to the gospel, there are many, many distortions and contortions of, of, of that message that have detracted from and have damaged many, many lives because the gospel has been misunderstood or abused or misinterpreted. We must have gospel clarity. It's important. We don't get to make it up. We have to find and understand the gospel message as it is given to us in the word of God. And what I fear is there are many people in many churches who don't quite understand what the gospel really is. And so the book of Galatians, I believe, is a timely one because we live in an age when so much of the understanding of who Jesus is and how he saves and what he saves us from and what he saves us for has been altered by cultural interpretations and personal preferences and what we want the gospel to mean versus what it really means. And so gospel clarity is absolutely necessary and it is supremely urgent. It's necessary because we as followers of Christ must understand the gospel that brought us out of darkness into the kingdom of glorious light, the the gospel message that helps us to sing the words The Lord is my salvation. That that gives us the heart of worship and a desire to obey. And it's urgent because there are many, many, many people who are on their way to hell because they don't know Jesus. And the gospel is all about how they can know Jesus. And so it's, it's vital for us to understand, not just to be clear, but to be urgent about understanding so that we are effective disciples and joy-filled, spirit-filled worshipers. Let me give you an illustration to, to begin with. You all learned this in math class when you were in junior high, high school probably, and that a one-degree deviation on a straight line would, would take you very far away from that, from that point, Right? You want to go from point A to point B in a straight line. And you, you, you chart an exact path. And you have to stay on that line to arrive at where, where your destination is supposed to be. And just one degree deviation from that, you won't end up where you planned. And the further along you go, the further away you are from your destination. And we, and we think one degree in the gospel, what's the big deal? One degree matters. And if one degree matters, then all the degrees matter. We have to get it right. We have to get it right if we're going to be the kind of ambassadors that God has set us apart to be. So gospel unity in a church matters. And understanding why it's urgent matters to us. Now you may be asking, okay, well, why Galatians, Pastor? Like why, what's the big deal about Galatians? Well, this is the issue that Paul is addressing in the Galatian church. They are having some problems understanding or remembering the gospel that they heard at first that brought them to faith as they saw Christ as he is and what he had done, his completed work, his finished work. They were having trouble remembering where they came from. They began to adopt some some additional elements. And so Paul had been through Galatia in his first missionary journey. We believe that the book was written somewhere in the late 50s, mid to late 50s AD. It was one of the earlier letters of Paul. This was before the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. So Paul does not, and you notice in the letter, does not reference 
the, the, the Jerusalem council. So Paul is addressing an issue that he would have later address among all the other apostles and believers in Jerusalem. But he's addressing this now to the church in Galatia because they are really headed down a, a really bad path. Now, where, where, is, where is Galatia? I think we have, a, we have a map we want to show you where Galatia is. You see there the, um, the regions that your, your Bible will, will mention, Cappadocia, Bithynia, Pontus, and the Galatia right there in the middle. The, these names are used throughout the letters of Paul and John and, and, and Peter for that matter. And so Galatia was kind of right there in the middle of, of what we call Turkey today. I'm sure uh, the, the Smiths can tell us right, right where that is. They would spend 27 years there. And so Paul is writing back to a church that he loved, that he knew, who has drifted away from the truth of the gospel. And what's going on in the church is an issue we would refer to as legalism. What happened in Galatia were some, some Jewish Christians have begun to teach in the church that salvation comes by faith in Jesus and keeping Jewish cultural laws. They accepted Christ, life, death, resurrection. They had that. But what they began to do was add some extra pieces to it. You have to keep the dietary laws and circumcision laws. And all of a sudden now what they're doing is they're bringing the old covenant, which Christ abolished, When he established a new one, they're bringing the old covenant into the New Testament church. And so people began to say, man, we can make all these rules. And you got to follow these rules or you're not really a Christian. And Paul's like, no, 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 (laughs) no. That's not the gospel. Faith alone in Christ alone is salvation. That's it. Faith alone in Christ alone. That's why we title it Only Jesus. Because it's only Jesus who can help us. Only Jesus can save us. Only Jesus gives us life. So here's what, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to read the first 10 verses so you get a sense of what Paul is addressing. I'm only going to preach on the first five today. We'll cover six through 10 next week. But I want you to hear the, the, the introduction to this letter. And if you know your Bible, I want you to be listening for how Paul begins this letter and how different it is from all the other letters or most of the other letters that that he's written, okay? So follow along with me. The book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So you can hear off the very top of this letter that Paul is just jumping right in. And if you know anything about the book of Galatians, as you will see as we walk through it together, Paul's, Paul has some very hard and harsh words for the Galatians. Since this is one of Paul's earlier letters, I think over time Paul became a little more gracious as he wrote, as the Spirit worked through him to write to the church at Corinth, for instance, which had a bunch of problems. Corinth was a mess. And, and Paul starts off with, I, I thank my God for you, right? But the Galatians, he tells them who he is. He tells them how he became an apostle. And he says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting the one who saved you. And let the one who's preaching to you a different gospel be a curse. I mean, Paul just jumps right into it. And some would say, well, man, that's, that, that, that's a little harsh. I think these words are really important for us. Not because we are guilty of this, but we could be. 
But there's always the danger that we begin to deviate from the gospel ever so slightly and apply our ideas and our rules and our motivations and expecting other people to meet our standards rather than God's. So we put these obstacles in people's way, which is what the, these Judaizers were doing in the Galatian church. They were saying, you have Jesus, now you've got to do all these other things. And if you get them right, well, then you can know that you're really saved. That is not the gospel. Never has been and never will be. So Paul begins the letter with the words, an apostle, Paul an apostle, and then he breaks off into, in some cases, you may have a parenthetical phrase here, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, Paul is confirming and reminding the Galatians of who he is. He's saying, I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. And he, he tells them, I'm not from man. I'm not from man's agency. I am from Christ. I'm through the power and the calling of Christ. I have come to you at first to preach the gospel, and now I'm writing to you to help you make sure you get back on the path. Now, an apostle is someone who's appoint, is an appointed representative from an official with an official status who is provided with the credentials of his office. So it's something, it's, it's an authority that is conferred upon this, this person, this apostle, by the one who initially called him. So in, in Paul's case, in the apostle's case, Paul was set apart by Jesus at a particular time for a particular purpose, to be an apostle, to plant the early church, to be the, 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 the hands that would write the scriptures as inspired by the Holy Spirit. He was a servant of the Lord, and he had authority, not because of him, not because he was special, because he was good, or because he was better than anybody else. That's not why Paul had authority. He had authority because Jesus said, you have the authority of my name to go to these places to preach the gospel and to tell the churches to straighten up. And so Paul is writing to the church in Galatia saying, hey, don't, don't forget, I didn't come to you by my own will. I, I wasn't sent by an, an agency. I came to you from Jesus. And I brought the word of Christ to you. Not because I'm special, but because Jesus sent me to you that you may hear and know him. So Paul is reminding the church of where his authority came from. Now we'll say the apostolic authority ended with the apostle John. There are no more apostles. John died, we believe, sometime in the 90s A.D. He was the, the last of the apostles to die, and the apostolic age ended at that point. If anyone claims to be an apostle today, false. I don't believe it. God had a particular th a time for those men to serve in that way in that first century to get the church rooted and planted and established, and it may grow over the centuries. And here we are today at Greenville Springs Baptist Church because those men were faithful in the first century. We can trace our heritage all the way back to those first believers. Some of you might even be related to some Galatians. My wife's family, we believe, is from Turkey. Y'all might be Galatians, Ginger. You never know. But God's been faithful to his church, has he not? He's been faithful all, all this time. He's been faithful to his church because the churches who have thrived and have been effective in their witness are the ones that have held on to the gospel as it is given to us in the scriptures. So... Paul appeals to the authority of God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. And then notice what he says, who raised him from the dead. So Paul is, is clear to say, listen, I'm not coming to you from a dead man. I'm coming to you from a man who is living. I'm coming to you from the Lord who walked out of that tomb. I'm coming to you from the one who paid the price for our sin, who died on that cross and was resurrected in power to give life, eternal life to any and all who would believe. Paul isn't just appealing to the one who died. He's appealing to the one who is risen and reigning. That's his authority given to him, conferred upon him by Jesus Christ. And so the Galatians have to stop for a moment and at least consider in the very opening of this letter and imagine the scene. They've received this letter. It's from Paul. It's from the apostle Paul. He wrote to us, oh joy. Yeah, 
Oh, what joy. Paul wrote to us. They don't even know what's in the letter yet. <laughs> and then the pastor, the elder, or the, the, the bishop, whoever it is, stands up before the people and opens the letter and begins to read. You fools, right? Is this from Paul? What? And they say, well, who, do you, who does he think he is? Telling us how to run our church, telling us how to, how to believe the gospel. What, what, we should, what we should believe about the gospel. And Paul says, uh-uh. No, I, I came to you under the authority of the king of kings. Hear what I have to say. Because you have deviated from the message you first received that brought you into the family of God. And if you continue on this path, there will be destruction for you and your church. So one of the arguments that I often make regarding the scriptures particularly about people who hold um, a very loose interpretation of the Bible, who kind of play a little, a little freely with, with the words. Well, maybe that didn't really happen, or maybe that isn't true, or maybe Jesus wasn't as powerful, or he wasn't as miraculous, or maybe the flood really didn't happen, or maybe the waters weren't really parted by Moses, or, you know, there's a lot, a lot of maybe, a lot of skepticism. I often ask people, I say, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Oh, yeah, I believe in the resurrection. Then what's the problem with everything else? If God raises Jesus and can raise us, then what's the problem with a flood or the waters parting? What's the issue with the scriptures? Are we going to pick and choose what it is that we're going to believe so it fits our lives? Or are we going to take our lives and submit it and surrender it to what God has said? Those are very two, two very different paths. What the Galatians started with was submission to the word of God, but now they have added some things to it and loaded up the carts and the wagons of all the believers, and now they're dragging slowly off the path. So the question for us is, are we going to believe what God has said? Either Jesus called Paul or he didn't. What do you believe? Either Jesus spoke through the Apostle Paul or he didn't. What are you, what am I going to believe? Because if he didn't speak through Paul here, then where else has God not spoken? When it's clear in the word of God, he has given us something to read, to understand, to believe, to take to heart and to obey. This is a challenge for you, church. I love you. It's a challenge for you. Consider the message of the gospel in your own life and ask yourself, what is it that I am believing? We don't get to choose the words we like and discard the ones we don't, which is very common. And it's not a new problem, by the way. This has always happened. Pick and choose the parts of the Bible we like, leave, leave aside the parts that we don't. That is not faith. That is not surrender to Jesus Christ. That's a convenience kind of theology. That is not what we're called to. God's church is blessed by Jesus when we hear and heed the word of God as it is written. It doesn't need to be adapted or changed or updated. God has not changed his mind. Let me say that again. God has not changed his mind. So do we trust him? Do you trust him? Will we as persons and as a church Trust him. The church was in danger. We need to be very cautious that we do not end up where they, where they were at the time when Paul wrote them this letter. You know, Paul warns the church at Colossae of the same thing. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So even the Colossian church which didn't have this same problem, was teetering a little bit. And Paul's like, hang on, don't allow yourselves to be led astray by what sounds plausible, but is actually deception. Not according to man's rules or man's laws or man's understanding, but according to Christ. You say, well, does anybody else in the, in the New Testament, any of the other apostles, confirm this in any way? As a matter of fact, Peter does. And we'll see in the book of Galatians, Peter and Paul, in fact, Paul had a beef with Peter, a real serious one, by the way, which we're going to get to in a few weeks. 
Paul straight up confronted Peter, called him out. Peter repented, and they became fast friends. But in the, in the book of, of 2 Peter, chapter 3, so I can find it here. I've got it marked in my Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3, this is what it reads. I want you to hear what Peter says about what God does through the apostle Paul. Okay, watch this. Therefore, beloved, verse 14, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. Who gave it to him? Jesus did. And he wrote to the church to edify and encourage and call them to follow Christ. Watch this, verse 16. As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. It's almost like Peter's writing to the, to the Galatians directly, isn't he? The teachers in the church were distorting the scriptures to their own destruction, Peter says. But watch this, verse 17, you, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the end, to, to, to the days of eternity. Amen. So Peter acknowledges that this is an issue. And the Apostle Paul's words are scripture. So it's not just Paul confirming his calling, but Peter says, no, no, you guys need to listen to Paul. God gave him wisdom, and now he's spoken to you. In the same way that God gave the word through Moses, through David, through the prophets, through the gospel writers, through Paul and Peter and James and John, and whoever wrote Hebrews. God spoke through these men. And so do we trust what they've said? More importantly, do we trust what God has said through them? This is vitally important. And you may be sitting here going, man, Pastor, I got this, man. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. You might be today. But there was a point which the Galatians thought they were good too. And then someone came in the door and go, hey, guys, what about this extra stuff over here that we could do? Make us more holy. Make us more acceptable to God. We can show God that we really are his people. Just keep these, these laws, circumcision, dietary laws, follow these rules, and then you can really know. And people are going, huh. Well, that sounds pretty good. I kind of like what you're saying. That scratches a little itch I've had about, about people keeping the rules, right? And now they've drifted. And they've lost their way. But here's the good news. Jesus... In Christ alone, by faith in Christ alone, blesses us with grace and peace. These gifts that he gives us. But they're only found in Christ. Only Jesus. We all want grace and peace in our lives. But the kind of grace that we need, the kind of peace that we long for, can only be found in the source of those things, which is Jesus Christ. He says in verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, Paul is, is extending a, a hand of blessing, grace to you, and peace. In fact, 17 letters in the New Testament have those two words in it, grace and peace. Paul and Peter, writing the letters to the, the New Testament church, begin their letters with grace and peace to you. Because those are the gifts that Jesus Christ gives to his church when we trust in him. He gives us grace and he gives us peace, but only in Christ. The Galatians are about to endure what I would call theological triage, and it's going to be very, very painful. They're not going to get a sedative. <laughs> They're not going to get local anesthesia. Paul's going right in, pulling that tooth out. No lidocaine, y'all. Just straight pliers and yanking on it, right? 
Like this is what he's doing. It's triage. They are bleeding out and Paul's putting a tourniquet on the church or they're going to die. But he says, grace and peace to you. I say, wait a minute, pastor. Wait, wait a minute, Paul. Like, first of all, you, you seem to have this bone to pick with this church. But you tell them grace and peace? Yes, because they were still believers. God had not written them off. Grace and peace in Christ were still theirs in Christ. The call was to get back to Christ and Christ alone. This is what Paul was calling them back to so they could enjoy and rejoice in the grace of God and rejoice and enjoy the peace of God that comes to them by faith in Jesus. All that baggage needs to be left at the door and come to worship and serve Christ and only Christ. The word grace is the word, in the Greek is the word charis. It's where we get our word charity from. It means life and hope and an eternal relationship with God that is unmerited and undeserved. Yet it is freely given by God to us because he loves us. It is not anything we have done to deserve this grace. The nature of grace, it's given when it's not deserved. In fact, we were ill-deserving of it. We had done everything we could in our power to not deserve grace. And yet God, because he's so magnificent and powerful, gives grace anyway. That's what you've received, believer, is this kind of grace. No matter how good you may have thought you were when you came to faith in Jesus, you weren't good enough. So God gives grace in Christ to bring you into his family. So Paul says, grace to you, believers, and peace from God to you. The, the word peace is the word Irene. It's where we get the name Irene from. Any Irenes in here? There's Irene. Where the name Irene, the, the English name, is from, is from this Greek word Irene. It means a, a harmonious relationship and freedom from conflict. So watch this. Grace to you from God that brings you into relationship with him. Now you have this peace which brings you into a harmonious relationship with God where there is no longer any friction, any conflict, any struggle. You have become one with Christ. There's a bond that is formed. There's a peace that comes over the believer because we understand how it is that that peace came to be in our lives. Because Jesus paid it all. He, made, he covered us and made peace for us with God and for God with us. The product of faith in Jesus Christ alone is an unbroken relationship with God, empowered by the Holy Spirit that gives us abiding peace and joy. But only Jesus can do this. Amen. Now I'm going to keep saying only Jesus. You're going to be tired of hearing me, you're going to tired of hearing me say it. Only Jesus can give us this. There may be grace, out, a type of grace out there in the world that you can find. There may be a type of peace that maybe you can find, but none of it's lasting, none of it's abiding, and none of it's eternal. Only Jesus can give us the kind of grace that we long for. You make peace with God? No. Jesus makes peace with God for you. It's a gift, and we receive it. Now, here's where I fear some of you may be. I, I never assume, I will never, ever assume that everyone within the hearing of my voice is committed to Christ, that understands the gospel. I will never assume it in a room this size. Unless I know every one of you so personally and so intimately that I am rock solid sure you have a, a, gri a grip on the gospel, I'm never going to assume that. And don't be offended by that. It's my responsibility to make sure that I'm clear on what the gospel is for the sake of just the one who may not understand. But it's a possibility that some believers in this room don't, don't quite have the peace you want because you don't understand the weight and the magnitude and the glory of God's grace to you. You may have grown up, like many of us may have, in a very legalistic system. I remember growing up, parents were awesome. Church was loving. I didn't hear a lot about grace. I heard a lot about law, though. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And so as a child, as a young person, I began to think to myself, well, if I don't do those bad things, drinking, smoking, sex, drugs, right, then, then I must be a Christian. I must be saved. 
if I'm not doing those things. Not the gospel. It's not the gospel. The gospel is believe and you are saved. Trust in Christ and you are his forever. It's not don't do those things. The result of faith in Jesus is that we have accepted this grace. We understand as much as we possibly can the magnitude of this grace and the response we have to that grace is to avoid those sinful things that would have drug us down to hell to begin with. But because we've been set free from the bondage of that sin, we can see where we would have been apart from Christ, and now we can see where we are now because of Christ, and we rejoice. But some of you here may be struggling with that today because you don't have a firm grip on God's grace to you. You're still trying to earn something from him. Stop it. You're all, you aren't going to do enough to satisfy your own soul. You have to embrace the fullness of redemption in Christ alone. That's it. And when we get to that point, when you get to that point where that grace is so overwhelming, flooding your life, seeing just how, how vastly God loves you, then you can live in peace because you know that Christ has done all that is required to make peace for you with God. And not just to end the conflict, to end the struggle. As the Bible would say, we have enmity with God. Not, not just to end it, but to bring you into a relationship with God where he calls you his beloved, blessed child. The double cure. Pardoned from sin and brought into a relationship with the Lord. That's grace. And the result of that grace is peace that never leaves us. In the darkest of nights, the deepest, darkest trials you may walk through, you have peace with the Lord. You may not have peace with your spouse or your children or your neighbor or your coworker, but you have peace with God. And that's the peace you need to carry on. And Paul here frames this grace and peace in verse 4. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. It wasn't that he just gave it. No, Jesus bought it, and he bought it with his blood. He hung on that cross because you and I are selfish and greedy and lustful and mean and bitter and resentful. He, he hung on that cross for all of that trash he paid the price that we owed so that we could live in grace and peace. We, we, the, the, the fancy words are substitutionary atonement. He was our substitute. He hung on the cross in our place, not just for us, but in our place condemned he stood so that we could then be set free. This is the gospel that Paul preached to the Galatians. And they said, yeah, yeah, we believe that, but what about this other stuff too, Paul? There's all the stuff. There's Christ. That's where it starts for all of us. The obedience follows grace. You want to understand this from the Old Testament? Look at the book of Exodus. Did God require the Israelites to do anything to get out of Egypt? Nope. Just trust me. I'll take care of it. When did God give the Israelites his law? Did he give it to them in Egypt? No, he gave it to them after he delivered them. He got them into the wilderness and he said, okay, guys, if we're going to be holy, here are the rules for, for holiness. It was not a means to be saved. It was a result of their salvation. The Judaizers, the Galatians have added on to salvation by by piling on extra rules that were never intended. Isaiah 53, this prophecy of Christ and who he is and what he did for us some 700 years before Jesus was even born. Verse 4 of Isaiah 53, Surely our griefs 
he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The perfect, blameless, spotless lamb of God. So you and I could stand in this room today and sing the words, the Lord is my salvation. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This is what Christ has done for you. Don't go back into the bondage of legalism and rule keeping in order to earn your favor with God. You have it in Christ. Let me make just a note here to all the dads in the room. This is a a big one, guys, so buckle up. If you do not have to earn the love of God, then neither should your children from you. If God is loving enough and bold enough and daring enough, and even reckless enough to show you the grace in Christ he has shown you, which is unearned, then dads do not expect your children to earn your love either. You love them, and you love them, and you love them. What that looks like for you is going to be very different. Situations, circumstances will change, certainly. Certainly. But if you start requiring your children to keep rules in order for you to love them, you've gone too far. Rules are good for the household, amen? Yes. If you don't have rules in your household, you're doing a bad job, dads. I'm telling you right now. You've got to have rules and expect your children to follow them. But those rules are not for them to earn your love. They are given to them because you love them. So display the kind of grace in your home that God has shown you when it comes to your children. A challenge to our fathers here today. It's all grace, every day, only Jesus. But Paul goes one step further. Not only does he explain to the church who he is in Christ, called by Christ as an apostle, not only does he tell them that they can be blessed by the magnificent grace and peace of God through Christ who bore their sins in their place, but he also says you've been rescued for a glorious future. Who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Jesus rescues us for something better. Okay? Jesus rescues us by his own sacrifice for something better. Now, this word, present evil age, is not just talking about, you know, 2023. It's talking about Everything that happens this side of the return of Christ. This present evil age is all the centuries that have have happened since these words were, were, were written. It's this world we live in that is still plagued by sin and the threat of death. Even though we are redeemed and saved by the grace of God and set free from the bondage of sin, we still live in a fallen world, don't we? We see it around us all the time, every day. It is clear. The clues are everywhere. Some of it's blatant right in our faces. Debauchery and wickedness and evil. Some of it coming from the church, from Christians. And so when we read the words, he has rescued us from this present evil age, what Paul is referring to is that we have been delivered from that bondage of participation in the evil age. That we no longer participate in the world's program for self-destruction. 
We have been set apart to live holy and righteous lives out of our love for God by his grace in his peace for his glory. So Christian, if you, if you are free in Christ, then live like it. Don't subscribe to this, this program of the world that will promise you the moon but drag you to the pit. There are two pronouns for men and women. Not says more than two, but there's men and women. That's it, right? There's two. That's, that's all that God gave us. Whatever else the world wants to make up, it's made up. It's invented. It's created. It's imagined. It's not what God gave to us. I know that's, that's kind of a hot button right now. It is okay. It has to be okay. Right? The church has to hold the line. A lot of talk about inclusion and diversity. The words are fine. I'm not offended by those words. But when someone uses them, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Because I've been called to holiness. I've been set free from the bondage of that wickedness. So I have to live a life set apart. And if I'm face to face with a person that disagrees with me, brother, sister, I love you. I care about you, which means I have to take the stand where I do. Because if I deviate, then the gospel that I display to you has no real power if I deviate. But if I hold the line, I stand firm on the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that I've been rescued from this present evil age to live a life that is holy and set apart for the glory of God, then at the very least, those who disagree and those who hate and those who mock and those who deride the gospel will not be able to say, they're just like us. They're different. Those people are different. Those Christians are different. That church is different. What makes us different? Because we live like people have been delivered from bondage. We're not walking around with the shackles of sin and shame chained to our wrists and and ankles, trying to claw our way out of a pit. We've been rescued from the pit. He set us up on a rock. He said, display my glory to the world by living in holiness because I've given you all the grace and peace you need to do so. And here's the reality, though. Tomorrow morning, Monday comes, and you got to drag yourself to work, and you got to get the kids up for the summer activities, whatever your parents are doing with little kids when they're not in school, right? And you got all this, the regular stuff of life that happens, and it's easy for us to forget that we've been rescued. So I challenge you as you go to bed this evening, dads, moms, children's, children, not children's, that's not a problem, children, come on. Little, little, little grace, little grace, okay? You, go, you lay your head on your pillow tonight. Just remember you're free in Christ. Just, just go to sleep with that thought just marinating on your brain. Free in Christ, free in Christ, free in Christ, and only Christ. And when you wake up in the morning, remind yourself of this truth so you can set your steps out in front of you as best you can to live the kind of life that gives glory to God because you have been rescued, dear believer, for a glorious future. And it starts today. It starts now. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter talks about a living hope. Chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Living hope. Living being Christ a risen from the dead, promising resurrection to all who trust in him, and hope being this unbreakable promise that all that God has said he will do, he will do. Only Jesus can do this in us. Only Jesus. There's no other way. I remember hearing a story about uh, the famous uh, scientist, Uh, Carl Sagan, some of you remember him from the uh, 70s and 80s. He was big on space exploration. 
Uh, Carl Sagan believed that there uh, were, were, there's life on other planets. There was a special that ran on PBS many years ago called Chariots of the Gods, if you, if you recall that, some of you. And he had a great optimism that there was life elsewhere in the universe. This is what he says. It's nice to think that there is someone out there that can be, that, that can help us. There's someone out there that can help us, he says. But Carl Sagan did not believe in God. He believed in aliens, but he didn't believe in God. And the thought in his mind is, my hope is that there's life out there on another planet that maybe, just maybe, could possibly provide help for me. Now, just a side note here. Every movie that ever involved an alien, they always come to blow us up, don't they? Like every single one of them, we have to fight them. No one comes in peace. They all come with lasers and bombs and they're blowing stuff up. We have to fight them and we always win too, right? The humans always win. We have inferior technology. We have inferior skill. But somehow we find a secret and we kill the aliens and they, they, they run all back to their planet. All right? Thanks a lot, Carl Sagan. But his hope, his hope was in a, a life form that exists on some other planet somewhere else in the great universe. And he says, it's just good to know that there's someone out there that can help us. What's to assume that they want to help us, right? Assuming that they even exist at all. When there's a God who made the universe, who is here to help us. So much so that he would give his only son to invade this world, not to destroy it, but to redeem it. This is Jesus and only Jesus. So I ask you today, who will you trust? This moment, in whom is your hope? Yourself, your spouse, your children, your parents, your boss, your employees, the tigers? Watch it. Where's your hope? Where's your abiding, lasting hope? It must only be Jesus. And the joy that comes from that, the blessing that comes from that is unmistakable. So as you leave this place today, be challenged to think on Christ, your only hope. If you would bow your head, I want to have a prayer for us as we close. And I'll be standing here after, as, as, as we sing in a moment. If you want someone to pray for you, to pray with you, I want to do that. If you're here today and you're thinking, man, I really don't know the gospel like I thought I did, let's talk about it. Or maybe you're, you're here and, and you know the gospel, you just haven't been living by it very, very well lately. That's okay. Repent. Fall on your knees before the Lord and call to him. He's there. He'll help you. Remember the love he has for you and trust in him today. God, we, we praise you and we thank you, Father, for the gift of salvation we have in Christ alone. All of our feeble, frail words, God, cannot fully grasp and capture this magnificent hope we have in Christ. We do the best we can with the words we have. Help us, Lord, to live our lives each day with a knowledge of Jesus. That we are committed to your word as it is written. We're committed to the gospel message as it is given. And that we do not add anything to what, what you've declared, that salvation comes by faith in Christ alone. There's nothing more required of us. And if we're working hard to earn it, help us to leave that legalism behind. And if we're not working hard to live in it, I pray to God we'd not leave here today abusing your grace, God, but living in it each day in holiness, knowing we've been rescued from the bondage of sin. Father, I pray that you would bless our church greatly. That we would be exalting Christ in every way we can by the gifts and the blessings you've given us. And may we as a church family never, ever be ashamed of your gospel, but share it gladly 
and proudly and willingly with those around us that they may also know you, Lord. We praise you for your goodness to us, God. Be with us now as we commit our lives to you again. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together and sing.